thank you very much for the invitation. I'm really uh, glad to be and flattered to be invited uh, and to share uh, some of our results with you. I also have to say I come here with, uh, I would say, two hats. One as a uh, head of uh, EMBL uh, Grenoble unit, which uh, the post I took middle of uh, last year, and the other one as a scientist. And so my first two slides are actually going to be uh, related. Okay. Uh, to the fact that with the first hat, and that is uh, head of EMBL Grenoble. And just for those who might not um, know the details of the uh, EMBL Grenoble site, I would like to just mention that EMBL Grenoble is part of uh, European Photon and Neutron Science Campus, which is in turn uh, composed of uh, IBS, the French Institute of Social Biology, ILL, and uh, ESRM. So all together, uh, together with the MBL, we are part of this uh, European um, photon and neutron uh, science campus, which is, of course, a very big um, scientific hub, but in particular, from my point of view, really brings together uh, a critical mass of different kinds of structural biologies. So, I believe that we are nowadays really in a golden age for structural biology. Uh, and in particular, when we think about this, uh, what I just showed you before here, we are actually in a, a really blessed position to be on the same site together with the brightest uh, neutron source on the planet Earth until ESS is going to be in, in uh, function and the brightest synchrotron source uh, on the planet Earth. Uh, together with the, what I said, the vibrant structural biology community. On the top of that, we have, of course, the known resolution or revolution caused by uh, developments in cryo-electron microscopy. We have gene engineering CRISPR-Cas capabilities, which are particularly important for combination with in situ structural analysis. We have alpha fold. Uh, and of course, all this allows us to really do integrative structural biology uh, approaches. Uh, being part of EMBL also brings additional, I would say, um, important uh, aspects, like being really in part of a big institution involved in molecular, such molecular uh, life science research which also offers a lot of um, scientific uh, services um, platforms to support uh, this research and being part of this of a new research program from molecules to ecosystems. Finally, I would also like to mention that the MBL Grenoble is not only a place for where we do, uh, of course, science, but also we do uh, technological, innovative technological developments of instrumentation for not only diffraction that, of course, started with the diffraction, but uh, also for nowadays currently for microscopy and X-ray uh, imaging, and also crystallization of robotics. And going back to what uh, Trevor uh, said, it's a slight uh, historical touch. EMBL Grenoble site was funded back in 75. That means that in two years, we have 50 years of uh, existence of the site. And that was funded there because ILL was there. And the management there thought that this is really, this was a very forward looking uh, decision to put a site there that can capitalize on the best neutron source uh, available to do structural research, research involved uh, with uh, structural uh, biology. A few years later, similar thing happened in Hamburg, where the uh, Hamburg site uh, was funded because of the synchrotron there. And actually, the first research was actually, as uh, Tiro said, propelled by um, research in uh, on in field of plasmas by Ken Holmes. So from now on, I will now switch to uh, a more research-oriented talk, and that is I'm uh, going to like to talk about the work we do on uh, muscle. And I would like to first remind us all, this is textbook science, that muscle as an organ 
is uh, composed of single muscle cells or muscle fibers, which are in turn composed of myofibrils, which are in turn composed of sar sarcomeres, which are the building blocks and the basic contractile units of serrated muscle. This crystallographer would say this is a unit cell. Now you have seen uh, this kind of a, a representation of basic filaments of uh, muscle, where you have actin filament, myosin sliding, of which uh, the two of them results in a uh, contraction. But you also see here chitin, which is the longest known protein, which spans from the beginning of the sarcoma to the middle of the sarcoma, it's some sort of a uh, molecular ruler and the blueprint for its assembly. But we are not actually interested in the contractor machinery, but rather in this area here, which is called the Z disk, which is the boundary between two contractile uh, units, which is sarcomeres. And this is where filaments, in particular the actin filament uh, from adjacent sarcoma is actually linked together by this major Z disk protein called the alpha activity. So linking filaments is an import, is important in, because if uh, everything were moving, you of course wouldn't get anywhere. So the filaments that are involved in contraction are need to be fixed. Furthermore, this they this also allow for transmission of force from one sarcomere to another in order to actually achieve the macroscopic uh, contraction. So. Here is schematic representation of the Z-disc. By now, uh, the current uh, director of proteins is somewhere around 50, 60. Uh, what I'm showing here is only the major, uh, the major players. So if you look at the sarcomere um, in the, let's say, standard way, you see these relations. That's where the striated muscle term comes from. This results from different densities of proteins along the sarcomere. And you can see the Z is the darkest, meaning the highest protein mm -hmm. density. If you do the transversal section through the Z disk, what you will see is this. Schematically presented here is basically, you can see that this is basically a paracrystalline, highly ordered structure, which displays a tetragonal. Uh, symmetry, where one actin filament from one sarcomere is surrounded by four actin filaments from adjacent sarcomere. And this material connecting them is alpha actin. So I find it, every time I think about it, really fantastic and amazing that in your resting muscle now, you have this paracrystalline, highly ordered organization uh, of filaments. In the under contraction, this uh, is a bit changed, but still uh, highly ordered. So this architecture has recently been seen also uh, with cryo tomography in cardiac or serrated uh, or skeletal muscles. And you can see again, uh, acting filaments surrounded and connected by alpha actin with this tetragonal uh, shape. Though these are, uh, pretty recent uh, reconstructions at about uh, 10 to 20 oxygen uh, solution. So uh, long-term goal of uh, my research uh, is to understand what is the molecular architecture and assembly of Z-disc, uh, muscle Z-disc protein. How do they uh, assemble? What the hierarchy of assembly? How does this... Uh, how do these proteins then basically come together from quite disordered initial assemblies called the dead bodies or disordered punta into something that is quite uh, ordered and also mechanostable? And how is then the, uh, fun the function and the force actually transmitted from one sarcomere to another? What you are also looking at, but I will not talk about because of the time, is uh, how do different disease mutations actually disrupt this finely tuned assembly? You, can, you of course know that there's a lot of cardiomyopathies and myopathies that are uh, caused by mutations in these uh, muscle proteins. So there's already some such information known about the different bits and pieces uh, of proteins uh, and 
some complexes in the deep with, but there is still a long way to, to go. And the, the way we are trying to address this is by integrative approaches, uh, combining different structural biology approaches, molecular biophysics and biochemistry on uh, reconstituted complexes. And we are now trying to go also in the direction of more uh, in situ uh, research. So the first thing I would like to talk about is uh, alpha T. Mm -hmm. This is the major Z-disc protein connecting uh, anti-parallel actin filaments in the Z-disc. So if you put uh, alpha actinin close to actin filament, what will happen is that alpha actinin will cross-link actin filament, as you can see here, all along their length. This does not happen in muscle. You can see actin filament only cross-linked by alpha actinin only in the Z disc. And that is because alpha actinin is actually targeted to the Z disc to, through specific interactions uh, regulated by PIP2. And these interactions have to do with interactions of alpha actinin with titin, is the longest uh, protein uh, and the, the blueprint of muscle assembly that I mentioned before. So as you can, you can see here, alpha actin is an anti-parallel dimer. It contains actin binding domains at the two extremes, which makes sense as an architecture that it can cross-link actin uh, filaments here. It is followed here, we have four spectrum-like repeats, and at the two extremes, we have a calmodulin-like domain. Nota bene, this calmodulin-like domain does not bind calcium. It has lost this capacity through evolution. Because contraction, we believe that that is because contraction is a calcium regulated process, and this being a structural protein does not want to be influenced by different concentrations of uh, calcium. But this calmodulin like domain actually binds to the juxtaposed subunit and to this connecting region called neck region, connecting by domain and the body, uh, the rod uh, part. So the model of the regulation uh, goes that PIP2 would bind to this polar head the actin binding domain with this hydrophobic chain. It would disrupt this interaction, this calmodulin like domain and the neck. This would open, and this part would now be able to bind to titan, to specific titan regions called Z repeats in the Z. And this interaction would therefore target alpha actinin directly to and only to the Z disc. So these eight repeats can come in different numbers from one to seven, with more or less the higher or lower affinities, particularly one, three, and seven we have a particularly high affinities. And if we look, do the sequence alignment of these eight repeats and this neck region you will see that there is some sequence homology, which also makes sense because it's some other like domain either binds to the neck or binds to the zeta repeat. And that's the reason also why this mechanism was termed uh, also liquid level regulated intramolecular pseudo ligand mechanism. In order to understand this mechanism uh, at a more molecular level, we first determine the structure of alpha actinine, which you can see. Here, this what you can see is a structure in the closed conformation, acting binding domains, spectrum repeats, three helix bundles, calmodulin like domain, clamping on this neck region helical, your neck region, uh, as the model was predicted. I always like to think that this rot region is fusilli like pasta uh, structure. Now, we then designed two different types of mutation mutants to actually investigate better this mechanism, proposed mechanism. One is we inserted mutations on the PLP2 binding site, where we mutated these positively charged residues where the negatively charged polar group of PLP2 uh, docks. <clears throat> and this, therefore, would be not activatable mutant. PLP2 not activatable mutant. And in fact, you can see that while the wild type binds PIP2, the, this mutant has a much reduced binding of PIP2. 
The other mutant that we designed was the opposite, I would say, is the constitutively active mutant where we inserted the mutations in this neck region here in order to prevent the difficult model in the domain to bind here, in order to generate a constitutively open mutant, which would therefore not need PIP2 to bind to type. This mutant uh, we called NIC mutant because that's the way the sequence that we mutated read after uh, afterwards. So we then, first of all, investigated the structure of this NIC mutant. Is this really an open conformation? We did that both this molecular X ray scattering, where we do see that this NIC mutant has an open conformation with. Uh, Carmody like domain not docking on the neck uh, anymore. We also used the double electron electron resonance in order to again confirm this open uh, conformation. We then used a lot of different binding assays where we saw that looked at the affinity of type in uh, wild type. Nick Newton has, of course, better affinity because it is open and this is comparable to the affinity of. Carmody like domain uh, on its own. And we also can check uh, the affinity of this uh, PIP2 mutant uh, to type in presence or absence of PIP2. So that this type PIP2 non sensitive mutant, of course, has the same affinity as the wild type because it cannot bind uh, PIP2. We also Check to whether this mutant that we created still has retains its basic function, which is binding to actin filaments. That was done by actin sedimentation assays, and we can see that in the sediment, uh, the we obtain actin, but also an alpha actin, but also Z repeat, which means that this mutant not only does it bind to actin filaments, but also brings it with itself. Uh, the titan, which is what it is expected to do, bind at the same time actin filaments and Z repeat. Finally, we also looked into in cells in the uh, cardiac uh, muscle rep uh, cells, ca cardiac muscle cells from uh, rats, and we can see that if we transfect them. With the Nick mutant, not to not see terribly well here, but you might like to trust me that uh, if we transfect with the Nick mutant, we really see a disarray of the organization of this strain creation, which means uh, of the assembly of the of the muscle, and we also see uh, a notable effect of the dynamics. That means that if we Transfect and look at the dynamics of the Nick mutant, there's the one that is constantly open. This seems much more firmly bound, fossilized on the Z uh, disk. And we believe that that is because it cannot close anymore and therefore it is always ready and prompt there to bind to the Z disk compared to the one type which is more sensitive. Finally, we looked at acting filaments decorated with the uh, acting binding domain. This is some quite old uh, reconstruction. Took then our alpha actinium and superimposed it. This is now superposition in PowerPoint, but what we did then is really superposition on both sides of acting binding domain. And what we got is this. And that's wrong, right? That's wrong because I said before that alpha actinium can bind and cross-link anti-parallel actin filaments. There's no such thing as perpendicular actin filaments in uh, muscle. And that is because, or, or even if you let alone muscle, but also if you put actin, if you do this in vitro, what you get is this uh, bundle. And that is because if you look at alpha actin in the close conformation, and you look along the rod region, so this part here, you will see that there is a built-in twist in this rod by 90 degrees, which means that this active vitamin and this active binding domain actually rotated with it by 90 degrees with respect to each other. So in this closed conformation, we cannot actually uh, achieve uh, this bundling uh, bundles formation. 
So what we actually think, think happens is that PIP2 binds, opens the conformation, and therefore this neck region, which is not docked by Calmodio lac domain anymore, unfolds. And we know that this happens because we have NMR data on, on this region uh, as well, alone. And this therefore allows for actin binding domain to reorient in the way to be able actually then to cross link anti parallel or parallel uh, uh, actin filaments. So we believe that it's actually you need this structural flexibility to actually uh, achieve the basic function, which is cross linking of active filament. Might be a bit counterintuitive that you need structural flexibility, but uh, you need to achieve this rearranged structural, rearrangement structural gymnastics in order to be able to bind at the same time active filaments and dock and be connected to tactic. Now, the next question we then asked is. Um, what is actually the mechan mechanics of alpha actin in titan interaction? Namely, affinities of titan that repeats to EF hence are low micromolar. Forces in the muscle are about under contraction about 200 picolewton. And the question is how is the task of firmly anchoring titan within the Z disk under applied forces actually achieved? So again, I would just like to mention, uh, repeat again, that we have this titan that repeats to which alpha actinium binds. We have different isoforms of titan. You have fast muscle, uh, which have less titan repeats and therefore is thinner than this. Slower muscles, which have more titans and uh, that repeats and thicker than this. That means you have more or less Alpha actin is bound in this region with this cross linking region. So, in order to understand the mechan me mechanics of this, we actually used uh, optical tweezers. Please uh, re be reminded here that when we think about force in muscle, the force is transmitted in a long actin filament, it's a long time. So, we use optical tweezers where we took uh, EF334, this chromatogen. Binding C terminal low, which binds to titan, made the chimera and start cooling. And so, what we saw is and here the force propagates through EF hands and titan. So, what we saw is that at about a uh, force of about um, 40 kilonewtons, we see the disruption of this interaction. And if we keep the force constant at about uh, 40 kilonewtons, we see these events of partial unfolding or disruption of this interaction of the Z repeat two EF hands and uh, then total unfolding. We could also determine uh, affinities of um, this repeats to Helmotri like domain by adding a, a peptide in the let's say reaction mixture. Uh, and we got the affinity to about five, four micromolar. We then did this for all uh, repeats, and we saw really high affinity for repeat one, three, uh, and seven. As you can see here, all about uh, low micromolar, while the repeats uh, two and five displayed weaker affinity, similar as also the neck, which is also obvious because the neck should have less affinity than the uh, Z repeats. After having done all this, we actually realized that the design of the experiment was not ideal because we were, as I said, pulling here uh, along uh, EF hands and titan. In fact, we should be pulling only along titan. Therefore, we redesigned uh, the uh, construct in order to really apply force only through the uh, titan Z repeat. And here, what we got is that. Uh, well, before we saw we saw unfolding at uh, forces of about three to four picolewtons. Now we see this unbinding event at twelve picolewtons. And again, if we see, it will keep the force uh, constant at uh, what was this about ten picolewtons. We also again start seeing this unbinding uh, event. Uh, also, we determined again the binding affinity. 
And so putting this uh, together is, uh, we could ask ourselves, how is now the task of firmly anchoring Titan uh, achieved? We believe that uh, we have a, here avidity at work. So first we have to remember that we have forces on a single Titan molecule, which are of about five picometers. Now, if we look at this concept here, which was where we were pulling along EF hands and they repeat, here we have a midpoint force of about 3.5 picometers. That means this kind of a construction does not actually sustain the forces that are applied in the master. But if we look at this design here, we can actually, when we pull a long Titan only, we see that in this way, this construct actually sustains forces of about 13 picometers. This means that the, the whole system actually evolved in the way to endure forces along the direction of active filament and Titan. Now we also have to uh, remember that we have several high affinity typing uh, binding types, one, three, and seven. On the top of that, we have to, we have of course dynamics in the, the binding and unbinding. So that means that in every time point, we have more than one of these interactions take, taking place. And of course, we have here uh, a VDT effect of three binding type, uh, binding, uh, potentially binding at the same time, where, of course, uh, interaction of free energy sum up together. Uh, and that, of course, means uh, hey, this multiplier. So we have, therefore, these dynamic bonds acting together to lead to a long-term stable anchor of titan, uh, of alpha kidney on the titan or titan on the alpha kidney. Finally, we also looked at uh, another uh, interaction between alpha actinin uh, and titin, and that is the interaction of this region called ZQ, which is after following this ZQ. So as you said, ZQ binds to this uh, thermodynamic domain, but the ZQ was postulated to bind somewhere in this uh, rod region here. So there is, this is a structure of uh, interaction between the model like the main and one of these Titan ZQPs. This is a model which was generated uh, 40 uh, years ago, which was suggesting that a dimer of these ZQs would actually bind to this uh, rod region uh, here. So, what we then uh, want to try to understand is what is actually the molecular mechanism that uh, drives this asymmetric sorting of alpha actin in the ZQ. As you can see, you see, if you imagine three alpha actin is bound into the Z-disc, you will see that this middle one will be bound to the z repeats only, while these outside ones would be bound to z repeats, but also to this ZQ region, which is here in the middle. So in order to uh, understand these uh, interactions, we designed uh, several different constructs uh, to investigate the interaction between Z to P7 and Z to the alpha Q. So Z to P7, Z Q alone is, uh, behaves as, the, as an utility disordered protein that you can understand from sensitive chromatography profiles, from uh, TB, as well as from the uh, Sumaibra X ray scattering uh, experiments, where you can see the Kratky plots uh, classically uh, representing a nutritive disorder protein. Now, in order to understand better the affinity, we designed a number of different constructs of alpha actinine and looked at how does this, how do these constructs bind to ZQ? And we saw that. The binding, if, as long as you have the rod domain, the binding is there. But if you cut the rod domain in half, that means if you have the half dimer, then you abolish binding, suggesting that you need this middle spectrum repeats two through three for the binding to actually take place. And in fact, this we saw then uh, solving the crystal structure of the rod 
in complex with the ZQ, where you can see that what we can actually see is only two linear motifs that bind to this central stacking repeats two and three, as we also uh, hypothesized based on binding uh, experiment. I have to say that this um, experiment or the, the assignment of the structure to this electron density was quite an effort. We actually uh, made uh, also some mutations, also selenium methylene mutant selenomethylene we inserted here in order to then exploit anomalous difference Fourier in order to assign the sequence uh, to the map, um, to the electron density. Now, looking at the alpha fold prediction of this region uh, here, uh, Z repeat seven and uh, ZQ, we can see that it is mostly disordered, but it predicts two helical elements. One is the Z repeat seven, which I showed you from the structure uh, that NMR such as I mentioned before, that actually uh, adopts a helical structure when it is bound to some other back domain and this LM1 motif. This part here, uh, is we don't know yet what it binds, but might might hypothesize that it binds to something at least when it is and the form helix when it is bound. Now we also generated some mutations in order to validate uh, the this interaction with its tiny and uh, alpha actinine, and we actually saw that if we abolish uh, if if in certain mutations we also abolish polyphonization of alpha actinine and tiny. Then we ask ourselves, is, do you really need the entire ZQ motif, or is it enough to only have the peptide that contains this LM1 and LM2? In fact, we see that you do need also these flanking regions that we don't actually see in electron density, but they are obviously uh, involved in assisting and enhancing the affinity. Then we also ask ourselves, is the length of the linker between the Z repeat seven and Z Q actually important. Can I shorten it or can I lengthen it and modulate the affinity? In fact, we can, but whatever we do, we disrupt, we make it worse. We thought actually that well, you could, by theoretically, we should actually be able to improve the affinity if we lengthen it a bit of the linker, but whatever we do, uh, we did lengthen it or double it or shorten it, we uh, disrupt the affinity, telling us again that it was really, cust it's really customized and that these connecting residues are also involved in productive uh, interactions. Finally, in order to then understand what is the structure of the complex between the and the field combined the geographic data uh, together with micro X-ray scattering data and uh, used uh, EOM, so uh, ensemble optimization method to actually generate this, uh, what in IDP world is called the fuzzy complex, where you can see that uh, titan actually remains apart from when bound to uh, alpha T in a, uh, still in a disordered, uh, uh, as a disordered problem. Now, looking at this interaction between alpha actinine and the uh, Z7, we actually saw that the, we have only one Z repeat, uh, excuse me, one ZQ binding to alpha actinine, although the alpha actinine is a dimer and there would be potentially space for both. And we believe that that actually is important in achieving this asymmetric sorting of alpha actinin where only one alpha actinin can be loaded by the ZQ uh, motif here, mm -hmm. meaning that alpha actually alpha actinin uh, or ZQ regulates its own stoichiometry in the uh, in this interaction. Finally, we wanted to see how does this uh, structure uh, look like. And therefore, we generated 
uh, a contract containing two ZTP, so alpha T of, of Titan and ZQ. We put an MVP on one side in order to be able to see the orientation. And therefore, we obtained a dimer of dimers, two alpha T's bound to two ZTPs. This is a rotary shadowing image. Uh, basically, what we were looking is at something like this without this intermediate alpha T. Here we have a low cryo EM reconstruction. I have to say we are still fighting uh, with this of this uh, construct. We have uh, everything, all the troubles that you can have, we have had with this from uh, preferred orientations to aggregations and everything. But uh, nevertheless, what we can do is compare this reconstruction with the cryo ET reconstruction that I showed you at the beginning that. Uh, where you can see these alpha teams cross-linking actin filaments uh, in, in this is a skeletal muscle zinc. So we can see that our construction actually nicely fits into the prior interior reconstruction in the zinc. So we haven't still given up uh, on this one, but uh, in what we are what we can see now is that uh, we have this alpha alpha teaming decorated with a uh, titan and that the titan itself is actually uh, regulating its stoichiometry and asymmetric sorting uh, of alpha in the brain. Now the last uh, few uh, slides I would like to spend on the last interaction with alpha teaming and that is with FATS, which is a intrinsically disordered protein. FAT stands for filamin alpha activin telatonin binding protein, meaning it has a number of binding partners, and one of them is alpha activin. Now, uh, FAT is uh, also an intrinsically disordered protein predicted as such, and we have, I must say, agonized over design of constructs in order to, to obtain to generate a constant that would not be obnoxious for years. Finally, what we use is a um, uh, erase the base approach that is actually developed by Per Nordlund from Karolinska. That is, uh, I would say, a poor man's uh, version of Esprit from Darren Hart. And with this approach, we actually then found two uh, constructs that were workable. One starting from position 92 till the undergrad, one going to 174. I have to say, this is none of such none of this part of would be designed if you were thinking. This was really something that came from this brutal screen. This yellow actually got us started. started. First, we again confirmed that yes, these are intrinsically disordered proteins uh, using molecular X-ray scattering. You can see here Kratky plots, and we can model these two constructs and the citroma construct as uh, ensembles, more or less, of more or less compact structures. Then we looked at the binding affinities. We can see here that alpha activin binds to fats, and I'm talking about C term of delta 91 region by a two events, nano, nanomolar and low micromolar affinity. We can abolish this interaction by designing these person mutations. We can also see that half dimer of alpha activin at the difference to ZQ here does bind to fats. Now analyzing the energetics of this interaction, you can see that it is an antarctically driven, which means that the interactions that dominate this uh, complex formation are polar, and I will come to this uh, later. Uh, then, we, then we wanted to use an uh, NMR to assign and map the binding sites of alpha activin to fats. This is the terminal region of fat. Uh, when we add alpha activin, we see the uh, depletion of a number of uh, signals, and that is those that are involved in, in binding. Therefore, we have a lower signal because there's a, a, a reduced sampling. Having done this, we wanted then to assign alpha uh, fats. Uh, unfortunately, we didn't actually manage to assign exactly the most interesting region, mm -hmm. which is the one where the binding actually happens. And you can see that you have the biggest 
effect of the intensity of the signals in this region that is here, but we could not give get the residue by residue assignment for this region. To this point, then I managed to convince somebody in the left to crystallize this complex because everybody saw that she's insane because she doesn't want complex or the intrigue. With antilipid disordered protein, we've actually got three different um, complexes with again seeing fats interacting through linear motifs, two short linear motifs. All the rest, this is, was a construct, was about 200 amino acids, was not seen in the electron density. Uh, therefore, we again use molecular X ray scattering to generate the uh, structural information on the complex to see what the rest of uh, fat uh, is doing. And again, we model it as a with, using EOM, and this is now an integrative model of alpha helium decorated with two molecules of fats. And you can see, again, this is a fuzzy complex with alpha helium being decorated on one side of its slightly concave surface, uh, rod surface uh, with fats. So I will skip this for the interest of time. But if we now think about the architecture and alpha actinium in muscle and decorated with fats, which is a hub for protein interactions, we can see that fat is actually stemming in a certain direction in the Z disk and therefore is attracting in certain place, in certain directions, the other binding proteins, the other proteins to be nucleotide. Therefore, being really an organizer of the Z disk assembly. Naturally, what I'm showing you here is, I'm pretty sure, not the way it looks in the uh, cerebral muscle because this many of these uh, parts will actually be loaded with other proteins that will not be intrinsically disordered anymore. But what I would like to show here is that these are the docking sites for other proteins uh, to uh, assemble. Now, in the, the course of working with alpha uh, with fats, we actually uh, saw that it actually forms liquid condensates. Uh, especially the citrum in the region actually forms this uh, macromolecular condensate, which was, uh, I would say, really a serendipity. We were, uh, yeah. we ran for fun the sequence through this uh, predictor of lipid phase separation, which got a very high score in this region here, which is also the region which is involved in binding to alpha -tini. And we, we looked under the micro but it did, we saw this uh, phase uh, separation. We then naturally asked ourselves that alpha can go in these droplets, and it does go, as you can see here, uh, with the molecularization. And you can also see that if you wrap it, uh, you will see that uh, alpha can actually re is replenished and exchange to the device, meaning that it can actually penetrate uh, this uh, mesh that is formed. In this Compensate. We also saw that if we increase the concentration of alpha actinine, we can actually dissolve these droplets. So there is a mechanism of dissolution of these droplets with increasing concentrations of alpha actinine, which also makes some sense because this phase separating region and alpha actinine binding uh, in part coagulants. So why is this at all important? Because we all know that it's those who have crystallized proteins have seen more condensates than crystal, uh, phase separation than crystal. Even this could be important because it's known that sarcomere biogenesis is a hierarchical process that starts from what is called Z bodies. These are pancta that merge together to form Z disks, mature Z disks. And in this pancta, the major components are alpha actinine and fats, which is the ones that I have mentioned before, and a couple of other uh, Z disk proteins that are also then present in the mature Z disks. So, could it therefore be that uh, these Z bodies are macromolecular uh, condensates? I think this is of less, this is a site of side uh, importance. More important, in my opinion, 
is the question how does an ordered paracrystalline system form from this disorder, partially disordered deposits? Could it be that this parts together with other some other proteins is actually some sort of a hub for protein protein interactions bringing the major players together and then of course uh, once they are brought together he actually disassembles how does it disassemble disassembles uh, because we have different concentrations of players uh, taking place uh, during the cycle of biogenesis in fact alpha two concentrations increase during the uh, sarcomere biogenesis in order to then lead to an ordered structure. So we have, uh, we are of course now trying to uh, play more with this. I think this is a Pandora box that we opened. And uh, what we have done so far is we have actually reconstituted uh, this condensate with four out of uh, six, uh, the body, base and body components. And if you add uh, alpha actin, actin, you actually see this first on the string uh, effect, which where the string I think must be uh, actin. And as we speak, we are doing now the same uh, adding also filamin C. So, of course, what we are doing now is on the one hand uh, using interview structure of cell biology and structural biology to, on the one hand, in vitro. To constitute the system we characterize the system looking at phase diagrams, hierarchy of interactions, also of course looking at connected complexes, but also uh, doing this in cells. And the system we are would like to use here is uh, we are actually designing cell lines is stem cell derived cardiomyocytes. In particular, there is a model which arrests at the stage of the Z bonds. This is a proponent knockout, which can be inducible. So one could actually look at the system, arrested at the same point, and then promote it into the uh, more mature step. Because we can, what you were using, we will be using here is, uh, of course, fluorescent approaches, looking at the viscoelastic properties of these eight bodies, but also for super resolution uh, microscopy and uh, dynamic studies like uh, FLAP. And I believe that this is also a good material uh, for uh, trying it from microscopy and tomography. Uh, perhaps also for x ray. Uh, so, if I have two more minutes, I will just uh, show one, uh, let's say, exercise that we, uh, we are performing as we speak, and that is using alpha, alpha code. To actually predict now the interactions of the Z disc proteins. Uh, we know that there are about 60 Z disc proteins. So for the moment, we selected 13, 16 different traits because some are uh, dimers or heterodimers, and we chop them into uh, domains so that we were actually doing pull down with about 90 different moieties. So, and we did pull down everything against everything. Uh, this is still in uh, working in calculating. You can, we got sort of a, quite a complex uh, interaction uh, diagram, but if we now, I'll just give you an example of one. Uh, we looked at, of course, our known uh, alpha team. We could see that we could nicely uh, predict some interactions in alpha code that we know are there and we are spot on, like with titin, like with uh, thus binding to the uh, PDZ domain of alpha to binding the PDZ domain of thus. It also nicely predicted some interactions with, for example, myotidin, but it also predicted some novel interactions, which are, of course, now uh, a good substrate for, uh, say, further uh, experimental validation. Another uh, example that I would like to show here is a nice, correct prediction of interaction of myotidin with uh, alpha TV. So this is the interaction of the domains only. If we now look at the prediction of the full 
myofibrils is composed of two IV domains and the rest of it is disordered. You can see that IV domains are also okay, but you can think of this structure here, which is difficult and that it comes like unnatural. In fact, it is unnatural because this is the prediction. This is actually the tax reconstruction of full length uh, myofibrils, which we did uh, using and again, um, EOM as the model to as a way to model the uh, ensemble. Again, interaction was predicted correctly, but the whole structure is, of course, it's known that alpha fold cannot do the dynamic, uh, dynamic uh, systems yet. Of course, what we are doing now is uh, doing this alpha fold pull down also with higher order um, oligomers and templates like actin filaments or dimers, heterodimers. Um, using therefore structural templates. So with this, uh, I will stop here and I would like to uh, thank my current colleagues, my past colleagues funding. Uh, and I would like to finish by saying that, by this African saying that says, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go in company. This is the company and shown here that was the last day of EMBL Granodre unit on the 31st of January this year. Thank you very much.